Hello, hello, good evening. Welcome to our Sanctuary Share Time. Uh, we're kicking off February with a whole conversation about self-love, um, mostly as it relates to compassion. I'm going to go ahead and get started with the presentation because I don't want to run out of time tonight. Um, I'm super glad that you're here. And if you're watching on Facebook, say hello in the comments. If you uh, see this on YouTube as a recording later, we're really glad that you did. And my soul care girls, you're here. Love that. And uh, I know um, you're going to get a lot of benefit out of tonight. And remember, for our soul care sanctuary, we'll meet next Monday to do uh, question and answer and feedback. Everything will start at six this month, except this call, because I didn't get the times changed in my notes. So sorry for that. Um, thanks for staying up late, especially my East Coast friends. Um, I'm glad that you uh, that I can help you maybe fall asleep tonight. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I am sharing a presentation on Canva so that it's easy for you um, to follow along. If you wanna take notes, you're welcome to do that. Um, I'm just super grateful um, for the opportunity to teach you a little bit about uh, what I've learned over the years about self-love. And it wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, this wouldn't be a complete presentation um, without acknowledging my mom's role in teaching me about self-love. In fact, um, many of you who uh, saw her memorial service last year will remember my mom was all about affirmations. And so one of the things that she encouraged women especially to do is to embrace their blemishes and their beauty marks. So being very conscious that our blemishes are just as unique and beautiful to who we are as our beauty marks. And so how to, um, to embrace those things. She used to say, uh, she would look in the mirror and give herself a thumbs up and say, looking good, layman. Um, so I think kicking off the self-love presentation tonight with that uh, reminder, looking good, looking good, um, and how we greet ourselves each day um, can have such a huge bearing on um, who we are and who we are becoming. As a reminder, um, I'm Angela, and um, I have been working with uh, in, in Young Living for... Um, for two, uh, gosh, 17 years now. Um, and we actively started coaching people in their business in 2012. Um, I decided to become um, a spiritual coach, a soul coach, if you will, um, in 2016, starting to take some classes and be around some folks in spiritual direction. Um, now I've presented locally and nationally. I host, uh, I host uh, wellness retreats. Um, specifically, this first trifecta has to do with grief. Um, I'm remarried after um, after a divorce, and now we share a 20-year-old, a 19-year-old, an 18-year-old, and a 16-year-old. And since my mom passed in November of 2022, it's made me that much more committed to this work of empowering women and being in the world to help see women emerge stronger than when we first started. I do have a disclaimer as I get started. I am not a mental health care professional, so if anything I says, uh, say tonight triggers um, deeper wounds or pains or traumas, I encourage you to reach out to someone in your life um, who is a trusted um, a, a trusted confidant who can help provide some um, uh, in-person or one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, care for your mental health. Um, I do want to note if you use the chat to write anything that's potentially harmful to yourself or others, um, it's a, I have a mandatory reporting law as a spiritual director um, to let uh, someone know that you could be in danger to yourself. I also want to qualify this by saying I offer these workshops monthly for free, and that's because um, it's content that I am designing as I go, um, and it's things that I think are going to help um, kind of elevate the entire uh, universe, truly. I really believe that by putting these kinds of good spiritual practices into the world, we can um, up left, uh, level up uh, the experience of ourselves and the people that we're surrounded to, uh, surrounded with. And this has also to do with the business that we've cultivated through Living Well Now, um, our Young Living community. So if you are someone who's part of that, um, hello. If you're somebody who wants to know more about it, hello. Um, we're happy to answer those questions. Um, we do want uh, this uh, to continue to cultivate a community of like-minded people um, who are sharing hope in the wellness industry. All right, let's go ahead and get started. 
Tonight, um, we're focused on the idea of self-love and self-care. And um, I hope you don't feel misled. Um, I expanded the topic as I was developing it more to encompass um, the places we go when the heart is open. Um, and this is a phrase that I've taken liberally from Brene Brown's book, The Atlas of the Heart. Um, I have considered this my uh, encyclopedia of emotions um, based on uh, her her uh, research as a qualitative psychologist, mapping meaningful connection and the language of human experience. Um, the work that she has done, as well as others in the field of knowing our emotions um, and getting to understand our connectivity better, um, I think are the things that are going to fuel us moving forward. So um, I'll start with a quote though, by a, a poet named Bell Hooks. Um, she actually writes her uh, name in all lowercase letters. So if you do see her quoted, um, just make sure you uh, honor that as well. Um, she wrote a book called All About Love that was published in 2020 um, and now has since passed. Um, so we remember her with love. She says, everywhere we learn that love is important and yet we are bombarded by its failure in the realm of the political, among the religious, in our families and in our romantic lives. We see little indication that love informs decisions, strengthens our understanding of community, or keeps us together. We still hope that love will prevail. We still believe in love's promise. And I think with the right map, we can find our way back to the heart and to our truest self and, the wor and where we go when we, when we examine love, what it means to have lovelessness, be heartbroken, to experience trust, self-trust, plus the, the um, obvious kinds of things that Bell Hooks noted um, of those things that love isn't always informing our decisions, right? Betrayal, defensiveness, flooding, and hurt. Instead, tonight, I'm going to focus on how self-love actually impacts our ability to love ourselves. Beth Moore once wrote, as long as we live, our self-absorption and our insecurity will walk together, holding hands and swinging them back and forth like two little girls on their way to a pretend playground they can never find. Human nature dictates that most often we will be as insecure as we are self-absorbed. The best possible way to keep from getting sucked into the superficial narcissistic mentality that money, possessions, and sensuality can satisfy and secure us is to deliberately give ourselves to something much greater. From Beth Moore, who's the Bible study writer, um, Jesus is her, is her center point. If you believe in a different uh, higher power um, or if yours does not have a name, we honor that in your listening tonight. As she goes on to say, Jesus showed us that giving rather than getting is the means to receiving. To find yourself, your true self, you must lose yourself in something larger. And that's the work of self-care, um, of soul care, I'm sorry, in the context of self-love. Um, and I wanna uh, explore for a minute the four types of love as defined by C.S. Lewis. And I meant to ask my daughter today because she has studied these um, for the correct pronunciation, so I'm probably going to screw it up, so I apologize in advance. The phrase, The Four Loves, came from a title of a 1960 book uh, written by C.S. Lewis. Based on a set of radio talks he'd done two years earlier, the book presents and then explores the notion that humans are actually able to feel different kinds of love, depending on the situations and relationships involved. He used translations from ancient Greek, because he knew that language had a large range of words to define what love can mean. So the four that he chose are storge, 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 stor, storge which is uh, the type of care that exists between family members, friends, or companions. Longer lasting, it goes beyond an initial infatuation or attraction. Built on a familiarity between people, the emphasis of storage is on devotion and intimacy that develops over time. Real life examples include parents toward children, siblings, spouses, and sometimes even very close friendships. Phileo love means friendship, 
It also describes a relationship between people who have generous warmth for one another. But in a broader sense, it can mean people in close community, maybe churches, towns, even cities. The basis of the common bond is shared beliefs, values, and or interests. An image that comes to mind as an example of this is good friends who look out for each other. But many churches and towns have what they call sister congregations or cities. Next is Eros. This is the type of love that is passionate. The kind of affection, this kind of affection is meant to describe a healthy sensual love um, and romance and physical attraction play a part in it. And the last one that many people are familiar with is agape love. And it should have a space in the in the way I uh, sent it or it, see, it you can see it on the screen. So I apologize for that. Agape space love. <laughs> so the word agape um, is probably the most talked about of the four kinds of love. It is the highest, most complete form of affection. God's love for us is the foundation of this love. And Jesus gave us many lessons about and examples of agape, a strong, selfless, and sacrificial love during his earthly ministry. Lewis makes the point that all of them can and often do intertwine. And he adds that they are displayed to others at their deepest and most meaningful level when they grow out of a love for God first. So when you think about, when I read these definitions of the four types of love, where do you come into play with love of yourself or love for yourself? Remembering that this is a connection that is built over time. And I think the other thing that's really important to note is um, when we expect more love from an outside source, then that person or being is willing to give or is capable of giving we are setting ourselves up for success. I mean, for failure. <laughs> and what I mean by that is sometimes we risk a lot in loving relationships. We give more in a friendship than, than we receive in return. We um, have to make do with in, insufficient parenting, which could cause trauma as children. We um, may be let down by a, a passionate lover of our past, present, or even in our future. So how do we start to think about receiving love from a higher power that is then translated into a more beautiful outpouring of, of expression toward ourselves and others? If we keep expecting that the love that we, uh, that we want from others is, is less, or it, you know, is le it ends up being less than what we expect, um, we can we can find ourselves hurt and sometimes jaded and sometimes cynical then about love in general. And I think that's what happens when we approach Valentine's Day and February and all of those things is that we're very um, we're very susceptible to uh, the cynicism that comes along with the Hallmark holiday of passionate love of Eros love. And instead, we look for opportunities like Galentine's Day. Um, or I used to celebrate Arizona Statehood Day because February 14th was the same day that Arizona became a state. So I would tell my friends, happy Arizona Statehood Day, and I would give them Valentine's with cactus. Not much different than what I did this year because I found these cute little pencils with cactus on them. They just happen to be marked as Valentine's. So keep in mind that, and I, and I don't mean just people will fail us, but sometimes our pets are another place where we where we expect a lot of respect and love or we um, cultivate a lot of um, love uh, for pets that in our lives or um, objects in our lives um, co-workers and we we hope that they're going to fill a void or a need that we have um, and then we're disappointed when they when they go away whether they die or we move on to a different job or it, it the the relationship fizzles out because um, because the circumstances change. So again, I love this quote from C.S. Lewis because it expresses the very heart of what we're risking every time we choose love is that to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. So it's helpful for me then to see the benefits of self-love. So if I'm taking love and I'm taking and I'm, I'm not expecting love from the, the things and people in my life, but I'm 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 taking love from God, from a higher source that is giving it to me freely. 
And that is my source of my, of my joy. It is the source of my love. It is the source of my peace. Then I am receiving that in, in order to love myself and then be called forward to love others. So five benefits of self-love. And this isn't just about how it serves me, but how it cultivates community around me. It actually helps me develop empathy. It allows me a willingness to take healthy risks, positive risks. It can lower my stress and help me build resilience. By cultivating better or self-love, I can create better boundaries with the people in my life that do hurt me. And number five is increased self-efficacy. So what that means is I have a better sense of, um, I, I have a better sense of my abilities and what I'm capable of so that I have, so that I have more opportunity to um, be successful when, when reaching a goal. So let's go through each of these real quickly. Number one, self-love is a means of developing empathy. So Brene Brown defined empathy as a tool of compassion. And those of you who were with me last year know that I'm a big fan of Kristen Neff's work in self-compassion and how we show self-compassion in order to show compassion to others. So this is a similar kind of thing. We're showing self-love to ourselves in order to build up our empathy. So this is an emotional skill set. This isn't just something that happens. It can be developed, allowing us to understand and reflect back what someone else is experiencing. There has been some early research done with what's called mirror neurons. Um, and it was done with gorillas or monkeys um, in 1992. And the short of it is that um, there's some element of our brain function that uh, can, uh, when we're confronted with somebody having a pain or sorrow or even a joy, we, uh, our neurons fire differently. There's a whole mess of things going on in our brain when we see that happening. And it, and it helps us um, experience uh, an ability to connect with others at, at a deeper level. Let me make sure I'm saying this right before I move on. I'm going off my, my own teaching here. Um, the more we share empathy and compassion with others, the more they grow. So each time we're, we're honoring our own pain and sorrow and others respond to us with empathy and compassion, that resulting healing affects us all. And so it's part of the cycle of growth and healing. But self, uh, but I, I want to be clear that sometimes we miss the boat when we're trying to be empathetic. So watch yourself and, and learn about yourself in your empathy. Um, this is directly from her book. You can uh, buy the book and, and look up this graphic later. But there are certain times that we, um, we respond with sympathy rather than empathy. Like, I feel sorry for you is the phrase that we use. And that ends up being a, oh, bless your heart. Like, it's kind of dismissive. And it doesn't necessarily make the other person feel good or it doesn't feel good to you. Perhaps um, somebody throws judgment at you. And so they, they hold your shame instead of allowing you to just have your story. They, you know, they say, gosh, don't you feel terrible? Um, or you should feel embarrassed. And so then you have to make them feel better by convincing them that you're not a terrible person. Also, sometimes people are trying to be empathetic, but they um, express disappointment. And now you've let this person down. Um, and so you have to be really you have to really grow in your self understanding and your self uh, and your self and um, your ideas of empathy and what feels good to you, so that you can reflect this back back to somebody appropriately. Um, another one is to discharge discomfort with blame. So is it your fault? Is it somebody else's fault? Like we can't just feel sometimes not sitting. Like if we want to feel badly, we don't get out of ourselves. Like we we want to look for somebody else to blame, so we don't have to feel that way anymore or we minimize or avoid the pain. Um, there's a really good book by Kate Bowler um, called, um, oh, she's got several great titles, but the one that I'm thinking of is um, all about like the placate, the placations that we give people like, oh, aren't you glad that she's in a better place now? Um, or, or, or things that we say about, um, gosh, it, it, and it minimizes the experience the person's having. Um, Heaven's such a great place to go, right? Like, I mean, things that 
that are supposed to be helpful, but maybe sometimes just don't hit right because our grief is that our, our family member isn't with us anymore or, or our pet is gone, right? Well, they crossed over the rainbow bridge and now they're playing, you know, playing with their other playmates. Also, sometimes we tend to compare or compete oh, that happened to you? Gosh, if you think that's bad, this was worse. And we want to one-up the person in our terribleness. Sometimes we uh, don't want to upset people or make them feel uncomfortable. And so if we don't hold someone accountable for their language or comments or behavior that marginalizes or dehumanizes others, it can cause discomfort or conflict. And so how do we choose to speak truth to power in the right moment? Um, and then last but not least is always not always, but solution, being solution oriented. Oh, it's okay. We'll just go hiking tomorrow and you'll feel better, right? Like we're, we're dismissing what they're really feeling. So consciously, the more we learn about our, our empathy and what feels good to us and what we can accurately give to others in our, in our empathy, um, will help us uh, increase our emotional, our emotional IQ and also help cultivate those deeper relationships. Self-love and self-compassion are directly linked. When we have a high sense of self-love, we're able to look at challenges as temporary setbacks or even as opportunities for growth. And this attitude helps us become more resilient. And so the research is showing that when we are coached and when we're aware and when we're learning these kinds of things, um, we can actually improve our empathy um, in, in community with one another. The next thing that it's good for is to, uh, when we're willing, uh, our willingness to take positive risks. I need to, I need to keep putting that adjective out there. This isn't like go jump off a bridge kind of risk, right? This isn't bungee jumping kinds of risk. These are the willingnesses. Uh, this is the willingness to take positive risks. When we're willing to do that, we're, we're doing that because we have faith in ourselves. We know that we'll be able to handle the outcome, good or bad, whether we get what we want or not. And a big part of that is trusting ourselves, but it's also a belief that you're worth the time, energy, and investment. So imagine this scenario, a loved one, like a child or a best friend wanted to try something new. If they shared their fears with you, their insecurities, would you tell them that they're probably right and that they're most likely going to fail? Would anyone say that? Or would you encourage them to take a chance anyway, because you believe in all the reasons it would work out? When you love yourself, you're able to identify both opportunities for growth and chances for you to shine. So you're looking for those small wins that are going to help you increase your confidence, adopt a growth mindset, and overcome setbacks. Risk-taking isn't just about doing something that seems fun. It's also about giving yourself the best possible chance to succeed. We won't get very far in life staying in our comfort zones. And that's one of the reasons I encourage, and we talk about in soul care a lot, our soul care sanctuary, are those little micro plans that we make to help us set a new path for the new month. What's one, what's something that we can do just 1% better so that we can um, celebrate that little risk that we took that had a good outcome so that we can do it again the next month. So what does that micro plan look like? Atomic Habits by James Clear doesn't say you're going to increase your anything by 20%, you're going to increase by 1% in order to get just a little bit better or a little bit clearer on what you want to accomplish. Having self-love also lowers stress and builds resilience. When you embrace your uniqueness, and I mean like write down the things that make you different from others, make you special, make you stand out in a crowd, when you have gratitude for your body and you start to really consider what a self-care plan looks like, then those are the little, the little uh, steps, maybe the 1% step that you can take to make a, an impact in your February, for example. No two self-care plans are identical. Andrea and I were just having a conversation recently. Andrea is my sister-in-law. We, we worked in business together for over 10 years. Um, and we had a road trip that, and last month together and we were talking about self-care. Self and one of the things that's important to her is getting facials. And one of the things that's important to me is getting massages. 
like neither of those things, I mean, both of them are self-care um, choices, but neither of them are the same, right? Everybody's going to have a different thing that feels good to them. When you identify activities that bring you joy, relaxation, and a sense of fulfillment, you have found those things that are nourishing to your self-care, right? To help you lower stress and to help you build resilience for the big world out there. So think about those things. Again, your unique makeup, gratitude for who you are in your skin, in your body, and how you create that self-care plan. Consider creating a self-care calendar or planner that helps you structure and prioritize your routines. So for example, um, I've, I've taken to setting my watch for a, a wind down period at night. So I know when that goes off that I'm about finished with TV and it's time to go take a bath, brush my teeth, wash my face and go to bed. And that's my new self-care routine. Scheduling dedicated time for activities that rejuvenate your body and your mind ensures that self-care becomes a non-negotiable part of your routine. So experience, experiment with different approaches and be open to adjusting your plan as needed. Flexibility is key to adapting to life's changing demands. For example, last night, I didn't get a bath before I went to bed. I stayed up too late because I chose to watch TV late. So I, I chose no bath time. Maybe yours is a daily mindfulness practice. Maybe it's nothing that you actually do. It, I mean, it's nothing that you have to employ other things, right? It's just you sitting quietly, turning on a mindfulness meditation, I've, I've recommended the Insight Timer before for those or YouTube guided meditation, um, or perhaps it's just setting a timer and sitting in silence and letting that soak over you. Perhaps it's a weekly nature walk where you leave your phone at home and you just take in the surrounding uh, area that you're walking in. Maybe a monthly self-reflection session where you're taking time to just be with yourself and your goals. The cumulative impact of these routines can contribute significantly to your sustainable and fulfilling self-care journey. And again, some of you are familiar with the fact uh, that I've been doing a 14-day reset now for October, November, December, and then I just completed one in January. And that to me is part of my self-care, drinking plenty of water, uh, eating nutritious uh, foods or having options that are healthier, increasing my protein, um, drinking my Ninksha Red, moving my body 30 minutes a day at least. Those, those are um, habits that I love to do in community with others for those 14 days, but I haven't stopped even though the reset is quote unquote over, I'm still contributing to my overall health and wellness and my self care by continuing those things at a limited, um, in a more limited way these next couple of weeks before the next one starts on February 12th. So there's no magic start time for anything. It's just about committing to the little habits that are going to make a big difference over time. When you start spending time learning about yourself and what you love to do, you'll likely find yourself pretty darn lovable. And I'm gonna go ahead in our Soul Care Sanctuary, y'all. I'm gonna put in, I've got a couple of handouts, a couple of different handouts that you can print out. I'll put them in our printed resources, but 14 simple ways uh, to practice self-care. Um, and, and love yourself. I just thought I, I found them in, in my preparing and I thought I'll just put those there and you can access those on your own and print them out. Maybe put them in a place where you can see them. Maybe star one or two. We'll discuss them on next Monday's call. Um, but maybe star one or two of them um, as priorities to, to start doing in, in February um, as, a, as a matter of practice and not just hope, hoping that it works out. Okay, this is a tough one for a lot of people pleasers and perfectionists is setting healthy boundaries. There's a saying that a dishonest yes to something you don't really want to do is an honest no to yourself. We often think that saying yes to everything and always willing to help is a virtue. However, a key part of self-love is knowing what to give your energy to and what doesn't serve you. Boundaries serve as a protective barrier, safeguarding your well-being and preserving your energy. When you clearly define and communicate your limits to others, you're creating a space where self-respect and self-care can thrive. Did you ever think that you would come to a presentation about self-love and hear about boundary setting? But this is so key to your overall respect of yourself is to have boundaries about what you do want to do and what you don't want to do. 
In fact, I once heard somebody say, if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. Reflect on your personal and emotional boundaries. Identify situations, relationships, or activities that drain your energy or compromise your mental health. When you recognize those, take intentional steps to set boundaries in those areas. This may involve communicating your needs assertively, saying no when necessary, or creating physical and emotional space when required. Now, I want to cl clarify in this that there are some, I, I've had lots of conversations about this with my 18-year-old son, because school would be one of those places that he says, creates stress, compromises his mental health, drains his energy, right? But it's a compulsory thing that he has to do in order to graduate high school and to move on in his careers, his career path. So reconciling healthy boundaries and understanding what those mean is different than accepting where you are at the moment. So if it's a work situation, if it's a, if, um, if it's a, um, uh, uh, like it, how you spend your free time, if it's a relationship that you have to have, it's a parental relationship and that's important to you to maintain, it may cause some stress, but are there ways that you can set healthy boundaries around them? Um, maybe uh, for you, it's putting on white angelica essential oil before going into a conversation with somebody that you know is toxic. Um, maybe it's checking your own self um, and your own uh, hard feelings. Um, and making some notes about uh, your own ownership of that um, before uh, before doing it. You can't change jobs, right? You can only change or change the person that you're in communication with. You can only change your perspective of the situation. So is there a way to limit um, uh, access to your coworkers that you don't get along with? Or is there a way to set up your schedule so that you don't overlap with them or Put on headphones so that you're uh, more isolated in, in the work that you're doing um, and and don't have because you don't have to uh, communicate with others in your in your cube or your area just thinking through some of those how do you set healthy, healthy boundaries um with with things that are you know your have to's right I have to do this um sometimes it's easier said than done you do need to uh stay consistent and self-advocate be firm in upholding the limits you've set, even if it feels uncomfortable initially. And it may be just a timer. Like I know I can only do two nights with this, you know, at a, at a uh, at traveling on the road. So I need to I need to set a, a time limit for myself. But surround yourself then as you're making these decisions. Find those people who are going to respect and support your boundaries. Healthy relationships are built on mutual understanding and consideration for each other's needs. As you reinforce your boundaries, you'll cultivate an environment that fosters self-love and allows you to thrive emotionally and mentally. That's a tough one. Am I right? Is that kind of a tough one to hear? Healthy boundaries is rough. Okay, next. Self-efficacy is a person's belief in their ability to complete a task or achieve a goal. It encompasses a person's confidence in themselves to control their behavior exert an influence over their environment and stay motivated in the pursuit of their goal. People can have self-efficacy in different situations and domains, such as school, work, relationships, and other important areas. So when facing a challenge, think to yourself for a minute, do you feel like you can rise up and accomplish your goal? Or do you just give up in defeat? Are you like the little train engine from the children's book? I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. That was one of my mom's favorites. Or do you doubt your own abilities to rise up and overcome the difficulties that life throws your way? If you tend to keep going in the face of obstacles, you probably have a high degree of self-efficacy. If you do not, these are some ways that you can build greater self-efficacy. This is what I keep advocating for as we as we go into soul care and we really look at um, our our inner our inner wisdom. Celebrate your success. That's why we have heart goals. That's why we have smaller goals rather than always uh, biting off the, the bigger bite of the elephant, right? It just takes one little bite. So find small successes that you can celebrate. Watch others overcome hardship. I cannot wait. A friend of mine recommended the movie Nyad on Netflix. 
And she said it's about a woman who um, was in her 60s before she accomplished a goal of swimming um, from the U.S. to Cuba. There were all sorts of rules about not being able to touch the boat and not, you know, all these things that were, this is a true story. Um, Nyad is the name of it. And I love I love winning stories like that. I love seeing somebody overcome obstacles in order to achieve their goals. Because then when I see it happen for someone else, I believe even more strongly it can happen for myself. So observe others doing it. Seek positive affirmations. Look for good. Look for somebody. Instead of pushing away compliments, thank you. Receive the compliment. Hear it. Write it down if you have to. People are giving them out and you may just be missing them because you're seeing the world through failure eyes. See the world through success eyes, through I, I, do, I, I choose to receive these compliments because I am, I, I'm, I'm, I'm loving myself. And last but not least, and I've said this a couple of different times during the presentation, pay attention to your thoughts and emotions. In the same way that we, that sad can breed sad, can breed anger, can breed fear, can breed insecurity, can breed guilt and shame. So can happiness impact other people. It's not just one big event, according to Harvard researchers, but the accrual of smaller incremental steps, such as gratitude and helping others. They're back full circle, back to empathy. Rather than asking how we can feel happier or more self-love, we should be asking how we increase the happiness around us. Because when we make positive changes in our own life, that uh, effect ripples out to others. And from there, you can find yourself uh, surrounded by what you are putting into the world. So when we focus on the things that are bringing us joy, those, those things will come back to us time and time again. I thought it was important to give you, and you can screenshot this if you want, um, I'll make a graphic of it later in the month as well for you. But these are some self-love affirmations. And again, part of this is making conscious decisions to stop the negative voices that are in your head. And we're going to do an activity here for the last 20 minutes that will allow you to um, will allow you to clear out some of the negative thoughts and start to replace them perhaps with one of these self-love affirmations. By consciously choosing uplifting and empowering language, you can reshape your internal dialogue and foster a more positive self-image. Start by identifying areas of self-criticism or negative self-talk. For example, I found myself very discouraged when I was telling people about my non-results from this last 14-day reset. Um, instead of celebrating the fact that I had made incremental changes and had maintained um, my, uh, my goals, even, uh, even during the last uh, couple weeks of traveling and um, and choosing to uh, uh, eat out a few times and and uh, and kind of just live my life, right? Note it. And a friend of mine said, "You you ought to be celebrating that that you know it. They were small changes, but they were worth it. Not everybody's going to have such huge, you know, like life changing goal goal shifts. You may have smaller ones. So accepting that." I was being harsh and overcritical of myself. And so I challenged myself to think about those things and started to replace those negative statements with positive affirmations. So those of you who've done Aroma Freedom with me before um, may have a whole list of things that you have written down as affirmations for you to pull out and use again, or perhaps to use some of these in front of you um, or listening to motivational literature. I've been listening, I know this is gonna sound crazy, but I've been listening to M Matthew McConaughey's bio biography or autobiography, Green Lights, this, this month in January. And one of the things that strikes me um, in, his, in his storytelling is what a positive, uplifting, motivational book that is, really. I mean, it's the story of his life, but it's also the story about how he overcame um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things in order to be, um, who he is today. So um, we're going to move into a time of listening for inner wisdom um, and we're going to use our essential oils. So if you have stress away, um, frankincense and lavender, that's the one that I recommend most often. But if you are um, new and you don't have essential oils, you can grab a citrus fruit or um, some sort of herb um, that you have in your kitchen. 
um, and cut those open so that you get uh, you get the release of a of a very fragrant smell. Um, we're looking for some not something artificial if if you can help it. Um, this process was uh, is comes from Dr. Benjamin Kirkus, um, who has been a clinical psychologist in practice since ninety five. Um, and he wrote a book called The Aroma Freedom Technique, Using Essential Oils to Transform Your Emotions and Realize Your Heart's Desire. So the, the foundation of this content um, comes from his, uh, from his good work and research. So as I exp express these topics of self-love, what do you think your biggest roadblock is at the moment? So is um, in order to embrace what I was talking about tonight, what is the biggest roadblock? And I, I want to stay focused on self-love because I think we too often can kind of push it away and say it's not that important. But if it's the foundation of our relationships, if it's the foundation of our uh, job satisfaction, if it's a foundational piece of, um, of, our, of our friendships and our ability to take care of ourselves and our ability to feel confident in ourselves and take risks, wouldn't that make it super important? So what is your biggest roadblock when it comes to loving yourself? at the moment. You can go ahead and write that down for yourself or you can put it in the chat or comments. Next, identify the feeling that describes how you feel about the situation. So what do you feel when you think about the roadblock to self-love? And I've given you a feelings wheel to take a peek at that. I also love your feelings are valid. The pillow that I that I had made. Then locate that feeling in your body. Keeping in mind that it could be a sensation or a posture. Next, identify the negative thought that goes with that. I'm too fat to love myself. I'm too depressed to love myself. I've never loved myself. It's a negative thought. Next, take that citrus fruit or herb or oil. If you're using the lavender stress away and frankincense blend or mix, I encourage you to use one drop of each. Mine's in a cute little container, an old 15 mil bottle that I, I, I uh, made into my memory release mixture. Go ahead and smell that, thinking about your roadblock to self-love, feeling you have about that roadblock, where that feeling is in your body, and the negative thought that goes with it. When you smell the essential oil, you're looking for something to shift. What's next? What shifted? Is the feeling still as tense, as intense? You still feel it in the same part of your body? Did you flip the negative thought into something more positive? You have some work to do in this area?
when you start small with one tiny change or decision. The reset can be done over and over again. You see how quickly it works, how quickly it shifts things um, so that you can get a new perspective that maybe you hadn't considered before. If you find yourself sort of mulling and stuck, it could mean that you need to do a full aroma freedom session. And for those of you in the Soul Care Sanctuary, I have those uh, recorded and loaded up in the resources section, or I will be doing another one on February 15th. So you can look forward to that at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. All right. So is there an action that you can take to overcome that roadblock to self-love? Out of what we've discussed tonight, is there one or more thing, maybe just one takeaway that you can implement into your life as soon as tonight or even tomorrow? Write it down. Write it down. What's it going to be? What's that action going to be? And we're going to put it into an activating affirmation. So picture yourself doing the step. Maybe it's something simple tonight, like setting an alarm to put yourself to bed at 945. That's when mine goes off. Name the positive feeling you'll feel when you picture it happening. And where do you feel it in your body? So I feel blank in my blank as I blank. I feel peace in my heart as I go to bed, start getting ready for bed earlier as a matter of self-care. See, see the simplicity of that? Now find a power pose that expresses the energy of this statement. And power poses, remember, can be arms above your head, usually standing, y'all. Hands on your hips, maybe a strong power pose or soft hands over your heart. But choose a different oil to put on, use your power pose, and state your affirmation. I feel peace in my heart when I set an earlier bedtime for myself. Could be with my hands over my heart. And I could use a sleepy time oil like lavender to set my intention and set my affirmation. Don't let this end with you tonight. Look for accountability. Maybe a trusted friend or colleague will call you out when you start to put yourself down. Maybe you need to reach out to our soul care sanctuary and be, in, be active in that group, asking people for ideas about how to, how to turn around some of the negative self-talk that you've been having or what it would mean to take more positive risks or set healthier boundaries in your life. Maybe it's changing something on your calendar or adding an alarm on your phone. Remember to celebrate those milestone accomplishments along the way. We'll talk on Monday, those of you in the group, we'll talk on Monday about how to take those small incremental steps toward bigger change. And always allow for grace. You can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. So as I mentioned earlier, coming up Monday night is Soul Care Sanctuary Care Circle number one. The 15th will be our Aroma Freedom session. The 19th will be our second care circle. And then the 22nd is actually our information session for the retreat. Um, the retreat website is up. You can uh, go and pay your down payment if you're intending to go. Um, I'm just confirming uh, all of my uh, bios and um, just and uh, headshots for my, uh, my guest speakers um, so that I can get all of that out uh, by February 22nd. Um, but I'm really looking forward uh, to having a full group this time and uh, and just really pouring into um, a, a deeper understanding of ourselves as we walk through times in our lives that that are tr transitory 
So this is still grief care, but it's a different, it's a different layer of grief care that we're going to do. And you'll hear more about it on the 22nd. We'll be in Carlsbad uh, April 11th through the 14th. And then a reminder, if you need oils, you can grab them by getting the person who referred you to them, uh, their member number and ID, so that you can um, you, you can uh, grab these oils for yourself because they're awesome. If you do not have the feelings kit, I highly recommend it. Present time, forgiveness, inner child, harmony, release, and valor. Um, remember, you can order that on loyalty rewards um, or just straight up as a shop order. And always, um, have, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm here to support you, um, to elevate your journey, your purpose, our people, and the possibility that is for the world. Thanks for being on tonight. Appreciate it. See you guys Monday. <laughs>